Good afternoon, Year 11. Again, something a bit different today. Um, some of you would have seen a version of this if you came to the seminars in Year 10. I know Stephanie, Sarah, Rasheen and so on, um, and various others uh, may have seen it, but it's the uh, seminar on Russian literature. I've tweaked it slightly and, and um, uh, it'll be on YouTube, on my channel on YouTube, if you want to have a look at it. Um, Russian literature is a particular passion of mine, actually. Um, so uh, anyway, onward. The golden age of Russian literature, um, 1800 to 1910. I mean, there were lots of writers in this time. I'm going to be uh, um, exploring it through the prisms of, uh, of, of the writers that I like, which will bring a bit of focus to it. Obviously, this is quite subjective. Um, there are lots of writers that I haven't included, but the, uh, the, the five that I've included are um, pretty much, most people would agree, the main ones. Um, they're representative of the canon and also uh, they are quite uh, explicitly linked as well, um, uh, as we see as we go along. Um, so there we are. You don't need to write anything down for this. Just sit and listen to me uh, whiffle on about Russian literature. Right, it, you know, the Russia, the golden age of Russian literature was 1800 to 1910. There is um, what's considered a silver age after that, which I'm also quite keen on, but it was the the, uh, the golden age when lots of the uh, precedents were laid down for um, the silver age, which came after. And then, of course, the Russian Revolution happened in 1917 and a, the totalitarian uh, regime was not at all interested in... Um, in people being um, creative or single-minded. Solzhenitsyn, who was a, um, who you may have heard of, was a, a part of the Silver Age of what people call the Silver Age of Russian literature, and he ended up in uh, in a gulag for his troubles. So uh, the Russians were well known, uh, the communist Russians that is, uh, were well known for um, their, you know, putting uh, writers, poets, and so on into gulags. Interesting, isn't it? Why put poets and writers into gulags it's because they speak a truth the good ones and the totalitarian regimes recognize that you wouldn't think that a huge nuclear power like russia could feel threatened by a poet or a writer but they do and did um, so the roots of russian literature can be traced to the middle ages when epics and chronicles were composed um, much the same as the rest of Europe when 99% uh, of people were illiterate. Uh, chronicles and epics were composed and they would often be in ballad form. So uh, people would stroll from community, well, stroll, travel from community to community, um, speaking these epic ballads, which was how stories got told, how mythologies developed and um, how people got a sense of themselves. Um, as, as in the rest of Europe, these were largely based on a mixture of pagan and Christian influences, the Christian influences kind of overlaying the original pagan influences. The Enlightenment, I'm sure you uh, you know what the Enlightenment is, um, a period in, in, in the history of Western thought and culture, stretching roughly from the mid decades of the 17th century through the 18th century, characterized by dramatic revolutions in science, philosophy, society and politics. These revolutions swept away the medieval worldview and ushered in our modern Western world. Some, I was reading a book the other day that actually nailed in Europe the, uh, they reckoned that the, um, that the Enlightenment was from 1716 to 1765, it's very precise, but it's certainly covered by that. Um, it was in Europe, it was mainly to do with scientific thought, you know, and throwing off the, uh, as I've said here, the medieval worldview, the superstitious worldview. We start to understand more about the world around us and how it works and therefore are less frightened and less superstitious. You know, we don't sacrifice virgins so that the crops come in anymore and, and those types of things. Um, that's enlightenment thinking. If you want to sum up enlightenment thinking, I guess you could say that enlightenment thinking is, is to strive towards empirical thinking, which is thinking based on data. And when I say data, I don't just mean databases and computers. I mean observable data, evidence that, um, of the world around you, thinking about it and coming up with a sensible conclusion rather than imagining that a demon must have put it there because you didn't see it happen, um, which is anecdotal evidence. Um, so the different uh, enlightened thinking is empirical thinking and um, 
non-enlightened thinking is anecdotal thinking. Um, we've got a lot of anecdotal, um, well not a lot, we've got a couple of anecdotal leaders at the moment. We seem to be in a, the enlightenment seems sometimes to be slightly on hold at the moment when you get Michael Gove saying we've had enough of experts. I mean, what exactly does he mean by that? That, um, you know, just make it up or, you know, look at the tea, look at the uh, tea leaves in your cup and see what they tell you. Um, obviously Trump um, simply makes it up as he goes along. So there's nothing enlightened about some of the leaders, but broadly speaking, we live in enlightened times that are becoming more enlightened. Anyway, gone off on a tangent there. The Russian age, Russian age of enlightenment was uh, slightly different um, in that it promoted further modernizations of all aspects of Russian life. So it wasn't um, entirely uh, science focused. They had uh, serfdom in Russia, um, which meant a lot of people were still, well serfdom is, is simply a, a, another word for slavery. People who were born into slavery and uh, and worked for the families for nothing um, all their lives and died in slavery um, and their enlightenment was a lot to do with the abolition of that and which then led on to the Russian revolution the communist revolution in 1917. Uh, most of this in Russia, Russia took place under uh, Catherine the Great. So towards the end of the enlightenment in uh, Russia uh, the golden age of Russian literature began picture uh, of some uh, people in Russia. It's always imagined to be rather bleak, isn't it? And it, and it is. I think that's why I quite like it. It's um, I've never been. Well, I have been actually. I touched down there once, but I didn't even get off the airplane. But um, so I've never been in any real sense to Russia. But um, it's said that when uh, the Germans tried to uh, invade Russia in the Second World War, and this has happened to various armies that have tried to invade Russia, that simply the size of the place. Um, caused them to have sort of mental health issues and they couldn't go on. It's so vast and so bleak and so uncaring, uh, the landscape, um, that it breathes a certain type of human being, uh, which paradoxically can often be uh, a very gentle and empathic person, but not always. Here's my top, top, top five writers of the golden age. Pushkin, who uh, can lay claim to writing the first real novel, albeit in verse, uh, Gogol, uh, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky and, uh, and Chekhov. So we're going to go through those and uh, talk a little bit about them. Alexander Pushkin, 1799 to 1837, best known for the novel in verse, um, Eugene Onegin. Um, it's considered to be the, um, it's considered to be the first, uh, the first ever real novel. Um, he's considered the master of Russian um, poetry and he created the classic Russian protagonist, which is somebody who's young, uh, quite clever, probably been to university, but dissolute also, probably a drinker or a drug taker, unfocused cleverness. Uh, that's the uh, young intellectually dissolute Russian protagonist and Alexander Pushkin was the first person to, uh, to invent that protagonist. Right, Nikolai Gogol, uh, a playwright, most uh, best known for the drama The Government Inspector. Um, I am who I am and that's who I am. Um, make of that what you will. Uh, he was ahead of his time. Um, this was, he was writing, The Government Inspector, for example, uh, is, a, is a sort of Kafkaesque trial type figure who comes to a town and nobody knows, really knows why he's there and it causes all kinds of problems. It's a comedy drama. Um, uh, which, you know, given that this was significantly before the, uh, very significantly before the, uh, the Russian Revolution, he could have been, uh, he's considered to be way ahead of his time. And it had another Russian, uh, another, another dissolute protagonist um, following on from Pushkin there. Tolstoy, probably the best known of all the, uh, the Russian writers. If you've ever, ever read anything, um, by, by, if you've ever read War and Peace or uh, Anna, Anna Karenina, it's hard to know how one person wrote these, particularly, you know, 
to keep track of all the characters in War and Peace is, uh, I mean, he's like a sort, it's like God or something. How he's managed to do that, particularly as he's not wasn't in a position like perhaps people are now, writers now who've got all this software that can keep on top of characters for you. Um, he did it without that. Famously, he did get the eye colour wrong in one character later on in War and Peace, but I think we can forgive him for that. Um, uh, he was, um, it, 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 when it came out, people didn't know what it was, War and Peace that is, whether it was a novel or a poem, and nor did he. Not a, not a novel, even less it, is it a poem and still less a historical chronicle. Um, nowadays, it would be considered a, a historical novel. Um, there's a whole genre of, uh, of things like that. It's kind of fictitious events draped around actual historical um, incidents. Um, very quotable chat. Man cannot possess anything as long as he fears death, but to him who does not fear it, everything belongs. If there was no suffering, man would not know his limits, would not know himself. Again, make of that what you will. Um, hugely intelligent man, very influenced, lived to a, to a, to a ripe old age. Because, um, well, let's have a look there. 72, 82 he lived to, so uh, very good age at that, uh, in, in those times. Fyodor Dostoevsky. Right, Fyodor Dostoevsky. Um, he was actually a contemporary and to some degree a friend of Tolstoy's, but obviously they're both writers. Um, if Tolstoy is considered to be the best novelist in the world, then Dostoevsky is a sort of novelist who um, almost invented psychology. I mean, people say Freud invented psychology, but I think he was sort of standing on the shoulders of giants like Dostoevsky when he did it. Um, he influenced Chekhov, who will come to uh, shortly, Jean-Paul Sartre and Ernest Hemingway. Uh, Crime and Punishment, his uh, most famous book, well worth reading. It's got the uh, the uh, dissolute protagonist again, Raskolnikov, who um, the whole book, it takes place in about three quarters of a mile in the middle of St. Petersburg, as it was then. And it broadly revolves around a uh, young Russian um, dissolute student who has no money, who has a horrible landlord, who uh, landlady rather, who and he murders the landlady. And the whole thing is a kind of a moral debate about whether he uh, should have done that or not, because that person was just a leech on him and everybody like him. So it's a moral debate. Um, interesting, given you know there's a metaphor there for the uh, the, the Russian aristocracy using the serfs and so on. Um, Raskolnikov, the uh, protagonist, can trace his roots all the way back to Eugene Onegin. Um, you know, Tolstoy is considered the greatest novelist of all time, and Dostoevsky is considered the greatest psychologist, way ahead of his time. I love this quote here. We're always thinking of eternity as an idea that cannot be understood, something immense. But why must it be? What if, instead of all this, you suddenly find just a little room there, something like a village bathhouse, grimy and spiders in every corner, and that's all eternity is? Sometimes, you know, I can't help feeling that's what it is. I mean, when... Uh, Tol Tolstoy was all about the wide open uh, spaces of Russia and he had a huge temporal sweep to his writing. He was writing across generations and so on. Whereas Dostoevsky is quite the opposite. He's all cramped and fussy and uh, you know it's all in your head and, and so on. So they couldn't be more different as writers. Tolstoy had the huge temporal and geographical sweep and um, Dostoevsky had the very cramped, paranoid, slightly mad thinking. And here, and here's my uh, favourite Russian writer. I think probably because he's the first one that I read at all seriously. He's I haven't read, I haven't seen too many of his plays actually, because he's mainly known as a dramatist, famously for the uh, for the uh, Cherry Orchard. Uh, a quote from him: "Any idiot can face a crisis. It's day-to-day -day living that wears you out." I quite like that. We're all on our metal during a crisis, but. Sometimes it's the drudgery of day-to-day -day life that, uh, that wears us out. Um, he, uh, any of you who are involved or have done any drama probably heard of Stanislavski, who was a dramatist who invented the, um, the method movement, which um, swept drama in the, uh, in the early 20th century. People like 
Marlon Brando and latterly Robert De Niro, Joe Pesky, uh, famously Daniel Day-Lewis. And they are actors who immerse themselves in the character. They become the character. They don't, excuse me, they don't do acting like um, John Gilgood or, or Laurence Olivier. They, um, they're they immersed entirely in their characters. Daniel Day-Lewis, probably the uh, epitome of method actors uh, made a film called My Left Foot back in the 80s. Um, it's based on a chap who was a painter. It's a real story of a chap who was a painter, but he had muscular dystrophy and he could only move his left foot all his life. That's all he'd been ever able to do, not talk or anything. And But he produced these amazing paintings. So they made a film about it, but Daniel Day-Lewis played him and for the whole 10 months of the shoot stayed in character. So he, stayed, he, he behaved as if he had muscular dystrophy for 10 months and could only move his left foot. That's what method acting is. And Chekhov was, um, his stories are famously all middle, no beginning and end. He drops you into this milieu, um, which is um, nearly always like based on the character's emotion and how they're responding to things around them. So he drops you right into the psyche of the character. And Stanislavski took that and built the, the method um, the method school of acting on top of it. Um, I love Chekhov. I mean, he changed me. It, it changed my approach to reading when I first read it. I mean, I used to read Chekhov. I read them all now, but sometimes I would have dreams. Uh, sorry, I would read Chekhov stories and feel that I dreamt them. That's how empathic he was. I mean, he was a doctor as well, a practicing doctor. So maybe that's where he got some of his empathy from. Now on the next slide, so we've just, before we go on to the next slide, we've got Tolstoy, who's got the large temporal and geographical sweep. We've got um, Dostoevsky, who has a very cramped, slightly paranoid um, outlook on the world. And then you've got Chekhov, who's got his, this incredible empathy for his characters. On the next slide, not handouts, on the next slide are samples of uh, three of those um, writers' works. I want you to read them, just see if you can... Uh, work out what they are. No, oh, I've told you straight away there, look, don't look at that if you want to read them. Um, one Tolstoy, two Dostoevsky and three Chekhov. Right, there's a creative writing exercise here if you want to do it, it's up to you. Um, we did, when we do this in the, uh, it's good fun when we do it in a seminar, because people do it then we swap and we see if we can work out who's written in which writer's style and it, um, it's amazing how well people pick up on this so I'm going to give you a start of that. Look, the family came from all over the world to attend his funeral and now you've got to choose one of these and uh, and write in their style so maybe Tolstoy's sweep both temporally and geographically, Dostoevsky's claustrophobic fo focus both psychologically and with regard to setting and Chekhov's emotional empathy that is expressed through his characters and if you want to send them to me, I would love to see them. I normally give a prize of a book. I give a prize of a book at the seminar. Um, so if anyone sends me some work, I'll do that. So uh, hopefully I'll hear from somebody. You never know. If not year 11, I hope things are going well for you and that um, I'll see you at NRA. Actually, there's more. Sorry, there's an epilogue uh, to, to that. Um, Karl Marx, who is um, actually German, not Russian, um, wrote the Communist Manifestos, which brought the golden age of, uh, um, and indeed the Silver Age of Russian literature to the end, to an end. Um, not uh, not during his lifetime, but he wrote it, and it was uh, taken up by Lenin and Stalin and so on. Um, the proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win, um, and it brought the golden age to an end. So there you are, the poetic beauty of Pushkin, the pre-revolutionary farce of Gogol, the epic vision of Tolstoy, the cramped psychological inner space of Dostoevsky and the empathic emotional landscape of Chekhov survived the upheaval of the revolution and continue to move readers all over the world. So there you are, year 11. I hope uh, you enjoyed that, made a bit of a change for you. Um, and I'll see you at NRA, I hope.